Hey everyone, I'm Ian Norman from Lonely Spec, and today I wanted to talk to you about how I make the motion time-lapse sequences of the Milky Way that you see in all of our videos. While we mostly focus on teaching still photography of the Milky Way at Lonely Spec, I think one of the next logical steps of astrophotography is time-lapse. So for this video, we paired up with Dynamic Perception to create this tutorial on how to shoot motion time-lapse of the Milky Way. Most of the footage that you see here was made using Dynamic Perception's Stage 1 slider and Stage R rotary axis. The combination of these two tools is perfect for time-lapsing the Milky Way because we get side-to-side -side motion with the Stage 1, and the Stage R lets us rotate the camera to track the Milky Way as it moves across the sky. Both of these axes and our camera will be controlled entirely by the MX3 motion controller. Shooting a motion time-lapse of the Milky Way can be broken up into three distinct sections. The first is how to make a great exposure of the Milky Way. The next is programming the motion controller and shooting the time-lapse. And finally is processing and compiling the time-lapse. All right, well, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is making a great exposure of the Milky Way. In this section, we'll talk about finding a dark location, equipment, camera settings, and exposure settings. Even if you're not shooting a time-lapse, this section will help you with the essentials of making a nice still photograph of the Milky Way. The most important part of photographing the Milky Way is finding a dark location. I use a couple of resources for scouting areas with low light pollution, and the first is called Dark Sight Finder, and the second is called Blue Marble Navigator. And both of these websites provide maps of light pollution from around the globe that can help give us a better idea of where to find nice dark skies. So once we know where to shoot, we should visit at a time of the moon calendar near the new moon. If you shoot on a night with a full moon, you won't be able to see much of the Milky Way. So you want to pick a night sometime between the last quarter and the first quarter of the moon calendar. The closer you shoot to the time of the month with the new moon, the more time that you'll have during the night with dark skies. A lot of people tend to struggle with finding the Milky Way in the sky the first time they try to photograph it. So the absolute easiest method to find the Milky Way in the sky is to use a star chart app on your smartphone or tablet. For iOS, I recommend an app called Sky Guide, and for Android, I recommend Stellarium Mobile. Both allow you to point the phone in the direction that you're facing to visualize where the Milky Way is going to be while you're shooting. And there's also a really great desktop version of Stellarium for Mac, PC, and Linux available free at stellarium.org. For camera gear, we should be using a DSLR or interchangeable lens camera with a wide angle lens. I usually recommend a lens with a focal length of 24 millimeters or shorter and a fast aperture F number of F2.8 or lower. It's also helpful to have a headlamp so that you can see in the dark and keep your hands free to change settings on your camera. And before you set out, check to make sure that you have a full battery and a formatted memory card so that you can take several hundred shots without running out of power or memory. So there are a few camera settings that I always like to check before I start shooting astrophotography or time-lapse. And the first is to make sure that we're recording in RAW. In order to shoot in RAW, you might need to first set your camera to a manual exposure mode. Setting the camera to record in RAW will preserve as much of the original image data as possible for the best results when we process all of the final images. Next is disabling long exposure noise reduction. While the setting can be helpful if you're dealing with noise, it also doubles the time that the camera needs to wait for each exposure, so we'll keep it disabled when we're making time lapses. Another helpful setting to disable is the camera's auto review. I like to keep auto review off because it tends to use less battery and you won't have light from the screen to spill over into the image. The next setting is white balance. We don't want the white balance changing at all during the time lapse, so it's important that we set a custom white balance temperature or even just set it to daylight so that it doesn't shift during the time lapse. If you're setting a custom temperature, I recommend a temperature between 3500 and 4800 Kelvin. It doesn't matter if the white balance isn't perfect because we can adjust the raw file later in post-processing. Now, if you're not already using a manual focus lens, you should make sure that you set the lens to manual focus mode. You don't want the focus point changing at all during the time lapse, so manual focus is pretty much essential. There are a few different methods that I like to use for focusing when shooting astrophotography. The first is to try and focus on a bright star using your camera's live view feed on the LCD. But if you're having trouble finding a star that's bright enough, I recommend having a friend hold or place a flashlight out at an adequate distance from the camera. To ensure proper focus on the stars, you'll need to make sure that that light source that you're focusing on is about 30 meters or 100 feet away. Once you're satisfied with your focus, it's sometimes a good idea to lock your focus ring down using a piece of gaffer's tape to hold it in place. Focusing is probably one of the biggest challenges that you'll encounter when trying to shoot the Milky Way, so it's important to shoot a test shot and check your focus. 
So let's talk about how to set our exposure and make that test shot. For the shutter speed, it's usually a good starting point to set your exposure according to the 500 rule. Take 500 and divide it by your focal length to get the recommended shutter speed. So for example, I'm using a 24mm lens, so I'll take 500 and divide it by 24, which equals 20.8, or about a 20 second exposure. If you're using a camera with a smaller APS-C sensor, make sure that you multiply your focal length by the 1.5x crop factor before using the 500 rule. Your aperture should be typically set to the lowest f number that your lens can support. The lower the f number, the larger the aperture, and the more light that the camera can collect. Finally, your ISO should be usually set to about ISO 3200 or higher. In general, I like to set the ISO to a minimum of 3200 if I'm using a lens from f1.4 to f2.0, and I bump it up to ISO 6400 if I'm using a lens with an F number of f2.8 or higher. If you're not sure what to use at first, just stick with ISO 6400 for now, and we can adjust accordingly. So for the example that you'll see here, I use 20 seconds at f1.4 and ISO 3200 just for reference. Once your exposure is set, you should take a test shot to check your focus and check the histogram to verify that you've got a good exposure. It's best if the histogram isn't too far to the left. Try to get it to sit in the center of the graph if possible, but this will vary depending on your equipment or the conditions that you're shooting in. If you feel that the image is still too dark, it's usually advisable to use a slightly longer shutter speed. Once we're satisfied with the exposure, we're ready to start programming the time lapse. So in this section, we'll talk about programming the motor delay, setting the interval time, programming the speed of each axis, checking the movement directions, and finally shooting the time lapse. The MX3 motion controller gives us a rather simple way to program each of our axes independently. When we first power on the MX3, we're greeted with this program control screen. For this demonstration, I'll be using the manual setting mode so that we can program each of the axes independently, and I'll be using the shoot move shoot mode so that the slider doesn't move while the camera is exposing. Pressing the up or down buttons allows us to see additional control screens. We can see the camera control screen, and we can see a screen for each of the different axes. I have my stage one slider axis plugged into the axis one, and I have the stage R rotary axis plugged into the axis two. I have each axis programmed to the proper motor RPM preset for each of the motors that I'm using. So if we go to the camera control screen, the very first thing that I like to set on the MX3 is the motor delay time. We'll set the controller to C mode, indicating that we want the camera to control the exposure, and then we can set the motor delay time. The motor delay time is the amount of time from the start of the exposure that the MX3 waits before moving the motors. Since we're using a long exposure, we need to make sure that the motor delay time is long enough to allow for the exposure to finish before the motor moves. So for example, if I'm using a 20 second exposure, a motor delay of 23 seconds will allow the exposure to finish just a few seconds before the motor moves. An important thing to keep in mind when you're setting the motor delay is that most digital cameras add an additional second of time per every 15 seconds of shutter time. So that means that a 15 second exposure is actually 16 seconds long, and a 30 second exposure is actually 32 seconds long. Just keep this in mind and make sure that the motor delay is at least a little bit longer than the actual length of the exposure so that the motor doesn't move during the exposure. Once the motor delay is set up, we may need to check the total interval time on the program control screen. This is the total amount of time between the start of each exposure of the time lapse. It's important that we set this number long enough for the exposure time and the time for the camera to clear the buffer and write the image to the memory card. This extra buffer time can vary a lot depending on your equipment. My camera takes a couple of seconds to completely clear the buffer, so I'll add a couple of seconds to the interval time and bump it from about 23 seconds to 25 seconds so that I'm sure that the camera will be completely ready for each consecutive exposure of the time lapse. Now that we have the motor delay set and the interval set, we're ready to program each of the axes. For this example, I want the time lapse to shoot for a full three hours. Since I know that my slider has about 30 inches of travel, I want it to move at about 10 inches per hour. So I'll select the axis one control, and I'll set the distance per hour to 10 inches per hour. Now the final thing to program is the stage R rotary axis. 
This is what will allow us to track the Milky Way as the Earth rotates, and I recommend setting it to roughly the same speed of the Earth rotation, which is about 15 degrees per hour. You can set it to faster or slower if you want a different result, but I found that 15 degrees per hour usually gives the best results. Alright, now that we have both of our axes programmed, we should just check that they're moving in the direction that we want them to. If we're shooting the southern half of the sky where the Milky Way galactic center tends to be, we'll usually want the rotation axis to move from left to right. In order to check the direction of the axis, I usually enter the manual movement mode for that axis and figure out which direction, plus or minus, corresponds to the direction I want it to move. Then in the axis control screen, I set it to that direction. For this example time lapse, I have my stage 1 slider moving from right to left, and I have the stage R rotary axis moving from left to right. When placing your slider, try to find a good position with distinct foreground elements in the shot. If you're placing it low in grass or brush, it's really helpful to first place down a blanket or a towel so that plants don't get pulled into the rollers of the slider. All that's left is to turn the time lapse on from the program control screen and wait for the time lapse to finish. When the camera nears the end of the slider, we can simply turn the program off. Now that we have our time lapse complete, we're ready to pack up and see what we got on the computer. In this section, we have two steps, processing and compiling. We'll talk about checking white balance, adjusting curves, balancing exposure, and enhancing colors in Adobe Lightroom. And then we'll quickly review compiling and rendering the final video in Adobe After Effects. So let's import all of our photos into Adobe Lightroom and take a look. I have all of my photos pulled up here, and if I open the first image, I can scroll through all of them really quickly with the arrow keys to get sort of a low resolution preview of the time lapse. Everything looks pretty good here, so let's jump to the processing part. I usually pick one of the photos out of the middle of the sequence to edit first, so select it here and click D on the keyboard to enter the develop module. Now, the very first thing I always like to adjust when editing any photograph of the Milky Way is white balance. Now the easiest method that I've encountered and the easiest way to get a nice neutral white balance in your astrophotos is to first bump up the vibrance and saturation sliders all the way to 100. By increasing the saturation of the image like this, it allows us to see small inaccuracies in white balance and tint. If we're set just slightly too warm, the entire image will look completely orange as it does now, and if we're set just slightly too cool, the entire image will look completely blue. So the neutral white balance point is the point where we see the best balance of blue and orange hues in the image. The same applies to tint. I think this image has a little bit too much green, so I'll modify the tint just a bit to try for more balance between the pink and green in the image. Now obviously this looks totally unnatural with all the saturation right now, so we'll reset the vibrance and saturation sliders back to zero by double clicking on their labels. Okay, now that we have a nice neutral white balance, we can go ahead and make some adjustments to the tone curve. I usually bring up the black point on the left side of the tone curve just a little bit, and then pull down the shadows to crush the blacks and give the shadows of the image a more film-like look. And then I'll increase the contrast by pulling up the highlights. I usually like to make a nice gradual S shape on the tone curve. Once I've applied the tone curve, I usually make some more adjustments using the tone sliders above. I think the image can use just a little bit more contrast. And I also want to level the brightness of the foreground and the sky a little bit more. I'll start by pulling the brightness of the sky down with the highlight slider and the white slider, and then I'll increase the brightness of the foreground just a little bit with the shadows and the black sliders. Something that I also like to do often is use the graduated filter tool. I'm going to start by using it to darken the sky a little bit. So I'll go ahead and click and drag my filter of the image to make a nice gradual transition, and then I'll select this little white dot on the filter to position it a little bit better. Now I think this is just a little bit too dark, so I'll tweak the gradual filter's exposure slider until I think the image looks well balanced. I want to add a little bit more punch to the Milky Way, so I'll increase the contrast slider a little bit, and I'll also increase the clarity slider just a little bit. I think that looks pretty good, so I'll go ahead and click Done. Now that the tones and contrast of the image are pretty good, the final step is to bring out some of the colors in the sky by increasing the vibrance and saturation sliders. The colors of the night sky are relatively subdued, so this will tend to make the image just a little bit more pleasant. Just don't go too overboard on the saturation because you still want the image to look natural. And that's just about it for adjustments. I always try to process Milky Way shots in this manner. It's a relatively fast workflow and it usually yields some pretty great results. Here's a quick look at the before and after.
And here's our final image again. So now that we have one frame edited, we need to apply all of the same adjustments to each of the photos in the time lapse. So I'll press Ctrl C or Command C on the keyboard to open the Copy Settings tool, and we'll make sure that all of these boxes are checked, and then we can click Copy. So now we're ready to paste these settings to all of our photos. So we can return to the library grid view and select all of the time lapse photos by selecting the first image, holding down the shift key, and then selecting the last image. And then I can right click and choose develop settings and then paste settings to paste our original edits to all of the frames. So once all of the previews load, I can open up the first image and use the arrow keys to scroll through all of the images for a rough preview of what the time lapse will look like. All right, that looks pretty good. And all that's left in Lightroom is to export all of our frames to JPEG. So I'll return to the grid view again and select all of my photos and click the export button. So in this case, I'll export everything to a subfolder on my desktop and I'll call it Timberline Time Lapse. And I'll have Lightroom name all of the exported files with a custom name and a sequence number. When exporting to JPEG, I usually use a quality setting of about 90%. I want the final video to be standard 4K ultra high definition, which is 3840 pixels wide. So I'll make sure that I set the long edge of the image to 3840. Once that's set, we're ready to click export. Okay, now that we have all of our images exported to JPEG, we're ready to compile the image sequence into the final video using Adobe After Effects. So in this section, we'll import the JPEG sequence, set the frame rate, create a new composition, and check our export settings and render the video. So when we first open After Effects, we'll want to select the Project Toolbar over here on the left. If you don't see this toolbar, you can open it by pressing Command-0 or Control-0 on your keyboard. In the Project Toolbar, we can import files directly into our project by double-clicking in this blank area. So I'll navigate to all of those JPEGs that we just exported from Lightroom, and I'll select the very first image. And if you look down here, you can see that After Effects automatically detected that this is a JPEG sequence. So you want to make sure that this option is checked, and then you're ready to click Open. Now, depending on your default settings, you'll probably want to check the frame rate of your sequence. And we can do this by right-clicking on the sequence and choosing Interpret Footage, and then Main. In general, you'll want this number to be 24 frames per second, which is the typical standard for most motion pictures. Once you've checked this value, you should be ready to click OK. All right, now we're ready to turn this into a new composition, which is as simple as dragging the JPEG sequence down to the Create New Composition button on the project toolbar. All right, that's pretty much it. Obviously, we could use Adobe After Effects to add different special effects to the composition, but for just a basic time lapse, we can jump right to rendering the video. So I'll select File, and then Export, and then Add to Render Queue. Now, before we just tell it to render, we want to check some of the output settings. For a high quality master for editing purposes, I like to use the Apple ProRes 422 high quality codec. So to set our preferred codec, we can click this little arrow next to output module and then select custom. And then under video output, we can select this format options button to select the video codec settings. And this is where I would select Apple ProRes 422 HQ and then I'll set the quality to about 90%. There's a lot of different reasons to use different codecs and each of them has balances between file size and quality but for a relatively high quality master, I personally tend to like ProRes 422. If you wanted to export directly for uploading to YouTube or Vimeo, you might want to try a more compressed codec like H.264. Depending on what settings you find work best for you, you can save those settings as a template by choosing that little arrow again near the output module and then selecting Make Template. And then all we have to do is give the settings a name. I'll call this one Time Lapse Apple ProRes 422 HQ and then click OK. So now in the future, I can save time by just selecting my desired export preset from the list of templates. Okay, last but not least, I'll click on the output file name and give this video a suitable file name. And I'll have it export to my movie folder and then I'll click save. Now we're ready to click render and wait for After Effects to render the final video. This process usually takes a few minutes, so it's a good time to take a break. Okay, now that it's rendered, we can go ahead and navigate to the file and see how it turned out. Well, that looks pretty good to me, so I think that concludes our tutorial on shooting motion time-lapse of the Milky Way. I'd like to give a huge shout out to the team at Dynamic Perception. They've put together a really affordable and well-designed system for making motion time-lapse, and have had a blast using it. You can check out all of their motion control and time-lapse products at dynamicperception.com. Once again, I'm Ian Norman. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more astrophotography related videos, please subscribe and check out all of our tutorials, gear reviews, and inspiration on LonelySpec.com. See ya!